I've got a nice viewer suggested problem today, and this comes from the 2013 USA Junior Math Olympiad. So the question here is, are there integers A and B such that A to the fifth B plus three and A times B to the fifth plus three are both perfect cubes? And maybe let's look at some hints before we jump into our solution. So my first hint is that a to the fifth times b times a times b to the fifth is equal to a b all to the sixth power. So that's kind of an obvious calculation, but maybe why would you look at that calculation in the first place? And that's probably because there is some symmetry built into this a to the fifth b and a times b to the fifth that is easily exploitable if you take their product. Now notice that AB is like a number just kind of acting by itself. My next hint will be involving the tool that'll be used in the solution, and that's Euler's theorem, sometimes called Euler's generalization to Fermat's little theorem. And that says if A and N are relatively prime, then A to the phi N is congruent to one mod N where phi of n is Euler's totient function. So that counts all of the relatively prime numbers between one and n. And then finally, my last hint, which should maybe be the first hint, is that the answer is probably no. And that's just kind of built into the wording here. Are there integers such that these are perfect cubes instead of find all integers such that these are both perfect cubes. So if you want to, maybe give the problem a go with these hints and we'll jump in with the solution. Okay, so hopefully those hints were helpful. Now we're ready to look at a full solution. And we're gonna start off by noticing again that if we take a to the fifth times b times a times b to the fifth, we get a times b all to the sixth power. Furthermore, we see that the Euler totient function phi evaluated at nine is equal to nine minus three, which is equal to six. And so that's from the standard formula for powers of primes evaluated in the Euler totient function. We can also just like count up all of the numbers that are relatively prime to nine between one and nine. And we'd see that we get exactly six numbers and those numbers are one, two, three, four, five, seven, and eight. Notice we had to throw, throw away three, six, and nine. So we've got six numbers there. But now noticing that phi of nine is equal to six, and this product is equal to something all to the sixth power, we see that this is congruent to one modulo nine if, the GCD of A times B with nine is equal to one. Okay, but then since nine is a power of a prime, that is gonna be equivalent to the GCD, or maybe not equivalent, but it will follow if we can show that the GCD of A times B with three is equal to one. Again, since three is a prime, that's gonna follow if we can show that three does not divide A and three does not divide B. So that's in fact gonna be the first thing that we will try to show. And we'll do that by supposing that these are both perfect cubes and then following our nose with the calculation. Okay, so let's do that. So let's suppose that these two are both perfect cubes. So we have a to the fifth b plus three is a perfect cube, I'll call it m cubed. And a times b to the fifth plus three is a perfect cube, I'll call it n cubed. And now by way of contradiction, let's suppose that this and statement is not true. So supposing that that and statement is not true means that three divides A or three divides B. But now since there's symmetry built into this, we can really only work with one of these cases and the other one will follow like symmetrically. So let's suppose that three divides A, but let's see, that tells us 
that three divides the whole left-hand side of this equation. So that's gonna be a to the fifth b plus three. Well, given that three divides three, so that's kind of obvious. But if three divides the left-hand side of this equation, that means three divides the right-hand side of the equation, which is m cubed. But since three is prime, that tells us that three divides m. But now we can just run that back through in the other direction. If three divides m, that tells us that 27 divides m cubed. Since three divides a, and we have an a to the fifth power here, we also see that 27 divides a to the fifth times b. But now putting these two things together, we see that 27 divides m cubed minus a to the fifth times b m cubed minus a to the fifth times b is just equal to three by this right here. So we see that 27 divides three. But that's clearly a contradiction because three is not a multiple of 27. So that means that it is impossible for three to divide a. In other words, we see that three does not divide a. And then furthermore, like I said, symmetrically, we can show that this is also an impossibility. So that tells us that three cannot divide b either. So that we've arrived at this step right here. So let's maybe get rid of this and then we'll have a brief summary and then move on to the next step. So let's see what we've got so far. So we showed on the last board that three did not divide a and three did not divide b. So in other words, a and b are not multiples of three. But that means that the GCD of both a and b with nine is one. So that means the GCD of the product ab with nine is one. And so by Euler's theorem, we know that ab to the sixth power is congruent to one mod nine because phi of nine is equal to six, like we saw before. Furthermore, if both of these things are perfect cubes, then that means that the thing that they are perfect cubes of are not divisible by three either. And that's because three is divisible by three, but that then a to the fifth b and a times b to the fifth are not divisible by three, which tells us that m and n are not divisible by three. But now we can translate this statement into a statement involving modular arithmetic. This means that m is not congruent to zero mod three, and n is also not congruent to zero mod three. But now we wanna translate this congruence mod three to a congruence mod nine to be in line with the strategy that we saw via Euler's theorem. So let's see, if m is not congruent to zero mod three, well then that means it can't be a multiple of three, but that means it can't be congruent to zero, three, or six mod nine. So let's write that down. So m is not congruent to zero, three, or six mod nine. And similarly, n is not congruent to zero, three, or six mod nine. That gives us six possibilities for m and n mod nine. Notice that we have m is congruent to one, two, four, five, seven, or eight mod nine. And then similarly, n is congruent to one, two, four, five, seven, or eight mod nine. But now, since we're really interested in m cubed and n cubed, we probably wanna use these possible values for m and n to find the possible values for m cubed and n cubed mod nine. We're gonna use a little bit of a trick to make our calculation easy. We're gonna realize that five is the same thing as negative four mod nine, four is the same thing as negative two mod nine, and eight is the same thing as negative one mod nine. So that means if we do the calculation of these first three numbers, well then the calculation of the last three numbers is fairly straightforward. So let's notice that m cubed can take on the following values mod nine. So one cubed is one, two cubed is eight, and then four cubed is 64, but notice 64 is one more than 63, which is a multiple of nine. So four cubed is one mod nine. But that makes negative four cubed 
equal to negative one mod nine, but that's eight mod nine. Likewise, negative two cubed will be negative eight, but negative eight is one mod nine, and then negative one cubed is negative one, but that's eight mod nine. So we only get these two possibilities, one and eight mod nine. So let's write that down. And also we have the same possibilities for n cubed. So n cubed is one or eight modulo nine. But now we're ready to work towards our contradiction. So on the one hand, by a previous calculation, we saw a times b to the sixth was congruent to one mod nine. So now let's calculate that another way using this new setup. So we have a times b to the sixth, that's the same thing as a to the five times b times a times b to the five, but that's the same thing as m cubed minus three times n cubed minus three by these equations up here. But let's see the possible values of m cubed minus three and n cubed minus three. So given that m cubed and n cubed are either one or eight mod nine, we see that that's either going to be negative two or five mod nine. But notice negative two mod nine is seven mod nine. So that means m cubed can either be five or seven mod nine, and then n cubed can also be either five or seven mod nine. But that means their product can only take on three different values, five times five mod nine, seven times seven mod nine, or five times seven mod nine. So that means this is congruent to 25, 35, or 45 modulo nine. But now we can reduce each of those mod nine pretty easily. So on the one hand, we have a times b to the sixth is congruent to one mod nine. But on the other hand, we have a times b to the sixth is congruent to either four, seven, or eight mod nine. So that brings us to a contradiction. And you might say, well, what did we contradict? We contradicted the possibility of writing a to the fifth b plus three as a perfect cubed and a times b to the fifth plus three as a perfect cube simultaneously. So that means the answer is in fact no, that was impossible, which finishes the problem. And that's a good place to stop.